Hey, good morning. Uh, this is uh, something to talk about with the Bainbridge Island Senior Communication Community Center. My communication skills aren't so great this morning. Um, and so I, I just, it's my pleasure as always to uh, introduce to you Ann Lovejoy, our uh, guru of gardening. So Ann, what are we gonna talk about today? Thanks, Karen. I, a couple things. I mean, for one thing, I take questions very happily and love to try to help you problem solve whatever's going on or figure help you figure something out. But I also wanted to sort of talk about something that's come up quite a bit lately, which would be uh, messy. Are gardens better if they're messy or super tidy? Um, and that is an interesting topic, and it's actually come up a bunch of times for several reasons. Um, recently, I was talking to a yard crew, and they were showing me that some of the plants were not doing very well. And then I showed them that they were blowing off all the, first they would mulch and put compost mulch down in the spring and then they would carefully blow it all off all summer um, in the interest of tidiness. And the roots were being exposed. And this, what happens when you use a blower on soil and plants is it's a lot like a hurricane tsunami event for them. Um, hot air blasting at very fast speeds really actually kills the top it can kill up to the top inch of soil. It's very hard on plants. The leaves can get whipped around and they get wind burn often. Um, and also, it, you know, when the soil is, is assaulted like that, the life of the soil retreats further down. A lot of the roots get exposed. Sometimes that destabilizes a plant. Sometimes they'll try to reach down deeper. But really what you wanna see at this time of year is not bare earth with roots sticking out. You want to see a nice, you actually in your garden at this point, whether it's edibles or um, whether it's an ornamental situation, what you really want to see is an even carpet. You shouldn't really see bare earth by now. By the end of May, early June, you want to make sure that all the plants overlap. And what I mean by that, it is not that they're crammed and crowded necessarily, but that they kind of overlap just a little bit. And it's one of the basic principles of permaculture um, is that when plants are in community the way they are in a natural environment, they cover uh, the soil in such a way that it traps this little tiny bubble of moisture at soil level. And that does a bunch of different things. It keeps that top inch or so of soil alive moist enough to promote bacteria and the soil biota, all the wonderful, amazing creatures that live in the soil, bring it to life. And those are the creatures that actually help feed our plants. Because a lot of the plants access soil nutrients by eating essentially bacteria poop. I mean, you know, it's like mini manure, right? Um, so when you have active biota in your soil and they're thriving and living, everything that they use out of that soil ends up cycling back through the plants. Of course, plants are also using their photosynthetic properties to pull in um, nutrients from the air and to change sunlight right into nutrients for themselves. Some of them like peas and beans and scotch broom and alders are nitrogen fixtures and they can actually pull atmospheric nitrogen out of the air, pull it all through their bodies, use what they want on their way down and they store any extra on their roots. And you'll see these little white, they look like teeny white pop beads. Um, all, all fastened on the roots when you pull them up. So when you are done with your peas, which a lot of peas are kind of cruising to the end of their first blush here, you might, instead of pulling them up, just cut the cut them off at, at ground level. And the nitrogen stored in those roots as the roots decay will release and um, be helping the soil uh, nutrient level go up. Does that make sense? Mm. Yes, it does. And as you can see, I rapidly move from one thing to another. So at any particular point when you actually want to know more than I've just skimmed over, stick your hand up or um, if uh, just jump in and say, wait a minute, what about la la la? Okay. Now, I have my first scheduled interlude. I okay. Well, care, you go, ahead, go ahead. I'm, I, I'm, I had no idea that uh, Scotch broom was a nitrogen um, helper because, you yes. know, that, I had no idea. So I'm going to not hate it as much. <laughs> it's so invasive. I mean, it just takes over. And, uh, but, but I did not know that about peas. And so we have a lot of peas. Actually, our peas particular are just blooming right now. So does anybody else have peas in their garden? No? So I, I just, um, yeah, you do. How are you? Where, where's the stem? They, they are not blooming yet. 
Oh, okay. So, I so think I'm with you. Yeah, I think they're late this year. I don't know why, but uh, th but ours are starting to get those big, beautiful. Um, well, it was so kind of wet for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. we started out, it seemed, with a lot of warmth, and then and then it rained, and then it rained some more, and then it felt <laughs> like it was January. Yeah. <laughs> and now summer's coming back. Yep, yep. This so I'm dressed. Week. I'm dressed yep. for that. Look at that. Oh, my gosh. You have, you have you got your Crocs on then, too? Yep. No, but I should. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, should. You should have your Crocs on, definitely. Yeah. Get those out, Reed. Come on. It's time. I know it's time. Not the senior center without Reed with his Crocs on. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Megan Kennedy. There's Megan. Hi, Megan. So I'm so glad that everybody is able to join us today. So we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, re renewing nitrogen back into the soil. And uh, there she is. There she is back. So you heard what I said about the uh, Scotch broom, you know. Yeah, and I also heard what people were saying about peas. And the thing is, this is a weird year. Some years you can put your peas in early and they will be bloomed out by now. And other years, like my peas, are, some of my bush peas are just getting started. They're just starting to bloom. Um, so a lot of it was, did you go ahead and do it back on President's Day? Did you sow your seeds? Or did you wait until uh, <laughs> Mother's Day or Memorial? You know, there's all these different- Flag Day. No, that was a little late. Lag day was a little late, Reed. That was Monday. Um, but it's okay because the weather's so strange this year, you might get a great crop of peas anyway. And I often tell people, try again in like the end of August, early September, I sow another crop and often can get peas really until like sometimes even at, um, Thanksgiving, I'll still get peas. It's worth trying a second crop, especially in one of the summers. We seem to be, I, I don't know, I don't want to make a prediction. Looks like we're going to have a gray summer like we, you know, those long gray summers. And in those years, kale and peas do fabulous. The beans aren't so happy, but it would be a good year to try to get an extra pea crop in. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, yeah, scotch broom is a, actually a very good uh, nitrogen fixer, a very strong nitrogen fixer. And that's part of why it does so beautifully. Um, and you'll see it growing in a lot of places where the soil is very poor, like along the roadsides and the verges. Um, and it's actually improving the soil, but unfortunately it's also got a lot of volatile oils in it, which makes it flammable, which means when people flick their cigarettes out of the car when they're driving, it can start a fire. And in dry years, you often see patches of black where somebody's um, set the scotch broom on fire driving by. Um, so it's kind of a mixed blessing, but it was introduced here. And I know personally about five people on Bainbridge Island who said that they were the ones who brought it here from England or Scotland as war brides. So I'm imagining that up and down the coast, there's quite a few people who brought some because they loved the color and it looked so cheerful in the spring. Um, the good news about Scotch broom, if you're trying to get rid of it, is older plants will not re-sprout. If you cut them at ground level, they won't come back. Um, they can be difficult to get out, um, but the weed warriors do have some strong step weeders that you can use, you can borrow from them if you get in touch with Jeanette Franks, or they'll come over and help you if you have a lot of scotch broom and need a hand getting rid of it. You can connect to Jeanette um, and she can help you maybe have a little crew come by and help you clean it up. Uh, it, it can be, scotch broom can be a little dangerous on a dry summer because if you pull up a lot of it and make a big pile, it has so much volatile oil in it that sometimes in a dry year, in a hot dry year, that pile will self-ignite, seriously. Um, and that's something you probably want to avoid. Mm -hmm. So rather than dumping big piles, get, make sure it goes to the green waste or goes to like tills or someplace that can take it and process it properly. Yes. We don't want it to be sent out in other, you know, out. Somebody buys it with the seeds in there. You don't want that. Exactly. Somebody doing what... what you know, it's going to be interesting. It's going to happen on the road up to um, Hansville. Have you been up on that road up there going up towards Hansville from mm -hmm. the Four Corners? And they have the, uh, they've taken the, the trees down and they have all scotch broom in there now. And it, mm -hmm. or it was anyway, a couple few weeks ago when I went up there. And uh, that would seem to me would be the conflagration there would be amazing. It might be. It might be an interesting year for uh, spontaneous wildfires. 
Um, yeah, that's the thing. When you clear land around here, what comes up is not necessarily the native, um, the native plants that you might want to see. Usually they do, but they're not always the very first to come and they're not always the fastest to grow. So sometimes what can happen of course, is when places get clear cut like that, um, the first thing that usually comes is fireweed and that is native and that's okay. Uh, but then after that, you start seeing all kinds of blackberries, um, most of which are not native, though some are, um, and salmonberry and so forth. And so the brambles make it more difficult to get in there and keep controls about the next layers of things. But here the natural succession is often alders. And then as the alders grow up and maybe some cottonwoods, um, you'll get hazelnuts, the native hazels and things like that. And then they provide just enough shade that the young forest trees can actually grow because they don't really do that great in full sun, interestingly enough, until they're a little older. So the um, young firs and cedars and things will start appearing after the first a batch of, of, of finer plants have gotten a little bit higher, taller. Yeah. So what can I tell you? Uh, what do we need to know? Huh? <laughs> yeah. So Anne, a question. Um, you mentioned the plants being close enough so their roots kind of intermingle. What if they aren't? I mean, I have a situation where I've got some widely dispersed plants. What should I do about that space in between them? Well, it wasn't the roots so much, but it is true that where the leaves go, the roots usually, like the drip line of most plants is about where their active root zone is. So the roots may go further, but that's kind of where the most, a lot of their feeding action is going to take place. Um, so you want the foliage to kind of touch. But when you talk about, you say you, your plants are widely spaced, are they in a garden bed, you mean? or Yeah, in a garden bed. Yeah. So it's just the way they got planted originally. So if it's a ornamental bed, no, no, it's a vegetable bed. Vegetable something. Okay, so what happens is whenever you have bare earth, you have an invitation to nature to do something about it, right? And so what it's going to do is not necessarily what you had in mind. So what I generally do instead is put, um, so like I use strawberries. In fact, I grow a lot of Marshall strawberries, which are the uh, the old local historic ones. I grow a lot of them for people who um, are interested in those old crops. And in a garden bed, those the straw the marshals don't make a huge carpet. So they'll put themselves here, there, and the, in other places. You can harvest those plants later, but they help shade the soil a little bit. I also use a lot of herbs and annual flowers in my vegetable beds because, for one thing, the herbs will stabilize the soil so that you don't get runoff. Um, and it keeps it also protects the soil from heat, drought, wind, erosion. Um, and all those things bring in pollinators like crazy, which is great. So I have in my garden, I have sunflowers and the beans go up the sunflowers in that traditional way. Underneath it are carpets of oreganos, six or eight kinds of oreganos, six or seven kinds of thyme. Um, the, I just keep only the Marshall strawberries per bed because I don't want the strawberries to get mixed up and cross pollinate each other. So, um, but, and then I would put in other things too, like between bigger plants, you can put onion sets, garlic sets, which are also um, insect repellent to some degree. You can tuck in some marigolds, which definitely have good pest uh, repelling tendencies, right? Uh, but what you want, and, and I also always put top dressing of compost and wet the soil before you do that and then wet the compost as you layer it on because otherwise you're adding dry material that will just suck moisture out of the surrounding soil. And that is not optimal, right? It's like a sponge, okay. just goes away. Uh, okay, yeah. great, wonderful ideas, thanks. Easy, easy things that, that are not gross feeders. Like that's one of the biggest pieces. There's, you know, there's a lot of theories of companion planting and most of them are not actually supported by scientific evidence. But a few of them are. Um, and one of the things is that really heavy, heavy feeders that like a lot of food, which would be um, things like tomatoes, and for instance, and peppers, are not gonna be super compatible with other things that need a lot of food. Um, and things like corn do best in big blocks by themselves. They don't do well interspersed necessarily with other things. So you do kind of figure out what the needs of the plants are as you mess around and try things. But it's always worth trying things because one of the things you learn quickly as a gardener is that if anyone has made up rules, it's rules for them in their own 
environment and not necessarily rules for you in your garden. And it's always worth trying something that feels like it might be a good idea. Unless it's like transplanting bindweed from the bushes into your garden. That's not a good idea. Right. <laughs> okay, thanks. That's great. That's great. I mean, I, I and it's working. We have uh, raised planters on our deck and uh, and the plants are overlapping and they're doing fantastic. We have, they're doing a great job. You know, Brian, Brian pretty much does all of our planting for us. And, and he's a, he, he's a, a, a avid follower of you, Anne. And so uh, he does most of the gardening. And so I, I think he has been listening to you for a long time. So, Well, here's and, one of the things. And first of all, I need to ask, do you hear my grandchildren fighting in the background? We just hear them and they, 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 they sound adorable. So I wouldn't worry. They're not, but okay. Um, <laughs> I was just trying to decide if I should go in and squelch their natural bubbly spirits. I think it's fine. Um, but I guess they're okay for now. So th the thing about uh, grouping plants too is that when you don't have, when you have a lot of space between the plants, what usually happens is that the soil dries out, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And plants, especially things like tomatoes, almost all their nutrition comes from this, the feeder roots that are on the outskirts of of their drip line. And with bigger plants, if you take off the lower branches, the drip line is still where that would have been if you hadn't taken off the lower branches, which are usually the widest. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the circle of growth is wide. And you, that, you can still put things like a thyme or oregano or a sweet alyssum and all that kind of low grow, shallow rooted annual stuff or easy, uh, herbs that don't require a lot of nutrients. You can still interplant those, but you wanna make sure that those plants get water because one of the things that happens is people tend to water around the stalk mm -hmm. and the stalk or the neck of the plant is not the part that takes up the most water or nutrients does that make sense yeah so what you really want to do is make sure that it's got a pretty even moisture distribution throughout the bed um, or the, the roots will sort of turn back on themselves and go back to where the water is, but that's, and then they'll go up because you, most people, if you're hand watering, very few people have the patience to water even an inch deep. Mm -hmm. And so after you think you've watered really well, take your finger and dig down. And if it's not wet for at least an inch, you need to either get some other kind of sprinkler system or go back and do it again um, and meditate or sing or something. Yeah, music is always important around plants, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and especially if you sing a lot of songs in the key of C, that is the magical uh, vibration for pollination, especially for tomatoes, but of many, many things. It, it's really interesting that many plants, especially tomatoes, shed pollen when they hear the key of C, that vibration, mm, which if you listen to pollinators is exactly where a lot of pollinators buzz. Isn't that so amazing? It is amazing. I mean, who's stupid here? Not nature, right? Yeah. So you'll see bees go up to a tomato plant, get on the edge of the flower and dance. If I do their little vibration and the pollen drops and they get covered with it. And that's not, you know, they're collecting the pollen for their own interests, not for us, but it, it's still definitely beneficial to us. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, speaking of tomatoes, uh, what's the outlook this year for our tomatoes? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Supposedly we're coming on a sunny week mm -hmm. with temperatures in the 70s. Night temperatures are coming up. That's really a good thing because one of the hardest things on tomatoes and peppers around here and things like nightshade, you know, potatoes and um, eggplants and so forth is the cold nights make it very difficult for those plants to succeed because they are temperature dependent and like beans as well. If, if it's the soils are still down in the forties, they tend to get yellowy and look really stressed out. It's not that they're hungry, it's that they're too darn cold. Now that temperatures are coming up, I'm seeing things greening up and looking a lot happier. Um, a nice a muffling blanket of compost can help regulate soil temperature so it doesn't swing so much night to day. Um, and a few cool days won't hurt a thing, but it definitely needs to be um, to even out a little bit for our plants to do well. I mean, my tomatoes have a lot of flowers on them, mm -hmm. and a few of them have a little bit of, you know, some little teeny tiny tomatoes on them, but they are not bursting out of their, you know, places yeah. the way they do some years we just haven't had the heat uh 
you know, you, if you have a sun porch, you'll probably have a better luck if you bring some of them in in big pots into your sun porch or greenhouse, of course, would do really well. You can kind of rig a small mini greenhouse by putting a large cage around tomatoes and using bubble wrap with the bubble bubbly bits on the inside around the outside of the cage, leaving the top open. And that really helps them retain whatever warmth there is. Um, oh, so yeah. leaving the bubblies on the inside or the outside? I'm sorry. Inside. On the inside, okay. Yeah. Okay, so in the flat part on the outside. And the flat part is on the outside, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. And you just stick it on with duct tape or painter's tape or something. And right. you know, it only has to be on for a few weeks, usually. Um, usually, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to say. But that's yeah. a really good way to give your tomatoes and peppers and things a little bit of a boost. Okay. Oh, I and love the that. little cages are kind of crowded, but at those, if you use the peony hoop cages on the that mm -hmm. are much wider, Right. And there's only usually two or three of them. It doesn't matter. Two or three uh, rounds mm -hmm. of metal. They're shorter, but they're fine. And they're not, you, they're, you're not supporting anything with them except the bubble wrap. So they don't have to be plunged deep into the soil. Right, right. Oh, I like this idea. I really yeah. like The other thing I wanted to mention is I was talking to several people who are trying grafted tomatoes, which is something I've done, used for many years. And they are much more resilient to temperature swings. But the really critical part of them is if you're used to planting tomatoes deep, so that they can root all up along their stem. You don't want to do that with grafted tomatoes because you lose all the effect, effic efficacy <laughs> of the root. And what, what the grafting does is it takes a root stock that's very hardy, very disease resistant, um, and very uh, resilient. And on top of that, they graft the most tasty, delicious kinds of tomatoes, but which might not have the same amount of disease resistance or might be much more temper temperature dependent. And the combination gives those plants a huge uh, leg up essentially, right? Wow. But if you plant the graft under the ground, you lose it. So yeah. that's really important to remember if you're um, working with any grafted vegetables is they have to be planted exactly as they are in the pot that you get from the nursery. Good to know. That makes sense? Yeah. Hey yeah. Nathan, do you have a question? Um, and I was just going to ask you about compost acidity. We have a compost system um, and it's active. We've, we've got new dirt and everything, but I've heard that um, certain soil tests might um, be needed in that it's too acidic. Is that? Uh, it sort of depends. I mean, a lot of it depends on, on your food feedstock. Uh, the compost by nature is relatively neutral and it tends to have a neutralizing effect on whatever you use. If you're just composting pine needles or something, yeah, it's gonna be pretty acidic. And our na native soils around here are almost all quite acidic. Um, but the more, the, but the compost and other forms of humus have a buffering effect. You can also, if you, you know, if you're concerned about acidity, because most vegetables kind of like a neutral environment, you can put granulated humic acid, just scatter it over your vegetable beds, for instance. Humic acid is the active principle in compost. Um, it's what makes humus happen. And uh, it, uh, what it will do is it actually, like I said, it buffers pH, it helps soils open and aerate better, and it actually promotes root growth as well. So it's one of those things that um, it's just a little simple. You can buy it in pellets, granulated pellets at a hardware store or most nurseries, I think, probably carry it now. Um, but that's a really, and it will tell you on the package, depending on how it's packaged, what the application rate is. But I put that down before I put down compost or before I put down mulch, and that will help soil build uh, texture, quality, aeration, all those things. Um, Do it. And for opening our acid, horrible, heavy soils, really nothing works except humus and aeration. Those are the only two, <laughs> like you're not gonna change the Northwest, but if you can get your soil better aerated and if you can buffer some of that acidity with humus, you can actually change the, your piece of the world. I got a Here, box of it. it. Uh -huh. Good. Second, Martha, Karen, I need to take another bread break. Okay. I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah, she's not in another bread room. So yeah, we, we do have very acidic. And of course, anybody that lives around here, you know, you dig down into the soil and what do you get? You get hard pan. So that's, that's always a, 
a challenge. What is that exactly? Is that sand and clay? No, hard pan, no, just a sec. <laughs> <laughs> the expert is just changing the bread around in the oven, so. <laughs> I had an accidental bread event this morning in which I had made so much sourdough starter that I ended up making 13 pans of rolls and bread. Um, and so rather than being done cooking them at 11 o'clock, I'm not done. But anyway, um, there's going to be a lot of sourdough here. Uh, my whole neighborhood relies on this. <laughs> so anyway, so hard pan, is that what you were asking, Megan? Yes. Well, with, no, that, I was just talking about the soils around here being acidic and, and that, you know, sometimes it, having, you know, planting things, it's a little bit of a challenge with the hard pan. I just was the one that brought that up. So. Yeah. So native plants don't mind the acidity because hello, they're native and that's what they're used to around here. But for a lot of the ornamental plants, I see you, Laura, um, acidity can be a little much. And for most of the vegetables, a lot of our edible plants, fruits and berries and all that kind of stuff too, they like a, a soil that's closer to neutral. So compost, I talk about this all the time because compost is your great buffer and that will buffer your soil and make it much more uh, hospitable for plants of all kinds. Laura. Oh, Martha had a question. Oh, wait a second. Just... Oh, Laura, do you want to go first? No, go ahead. It's okay. Martha? Okay, I, um, I'm growing broccoli for the first time in my life, and it's horrible because all it is is leaves. There's no kind of like broccoli in the middle. I mean, not broccoli. Yeah, broccoli. Yeah, there's no like the, the thing you buy at the store in the middle. So I'm tempted to just pull them all out and just eat the roots, eat the stems. I guess you, people make stuff out of the stems, and, and then that can be the place where I'll do uh, zucchini if it ever gets nice enough for zucchini. So, uh, so broccoli, did you, when did you plant the black broccoli starts? A long time ago, I don't remember. Well, I mean, it sort of matters because for one, it takes a while for them to come, what broccoli is basically flower buds, the part we eat. So if it hasn't bloomed yet, it hasn't headed oh. up to make, um, but it probably will. This is actually good, weather for that kind of, uh, for kale and, and broccoli and things like that. So I would say give it some more time and okay. see in the next few weeks if it doesn't start to um, to head up for you. But yeah, you could certainly eat the leaves, shred them up and put them in soup or anything like that. But um, yeah, that's a funny thing because we don't think of broccoli as buds, but it is. It's, it's unbloomed, uh, tight little buds. And if you left them alone, they'd all burst into bloom. All right, thank you. Laura. Hi, um, kind of going back to the hard pan discussion. I have obviously a lot of that. And so I created a pretty significant um, raised bed for some ornamentals. And we live kind of on a slight slope. So the water all comes down the hill toward my raised bed. But my raised bed's probably about two feet above the soil line and the soil is probably about a foot deep before you hit the hard pan. And I'm still having a pretty significant drainage problem. Once you get down pat, down into my raised bed, I've lost two Japanese maples, I think because too much moisture. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, I'm thinking, should I put a French drain in? What should I do to- Yeah, and in a situation water? like that, French drain is always a good place to start. And any paths you make should be excavated and filled with gravel like a French drain. Use that system. A lot of people dig out the beds and fill them up, but in heavy soils like that, you're just making a bathtub to drown a plant in. Mm. So that's not where you want to go, which but by digging out your paths, filling them with, with gravel, and if you can sort of uh, make the slope of the trench that you make going toward the place you want your excess moisture to go, that's a plus too, because you're going to funnel it away. And then raising the beds, elevating, make mounded beds, which don't need to have sides. I mean, I'd get a dump truck and just have them dump oh, yeah. the yards and rake it out and plant right into that. Now, one of the problems with, with uh, maples, especially the Japanese maples, is virtually almost all of the, nat of the nursery stock has verticillium latent in it. Junko okay. used to say it was just a crapshoot. Um, so verticillium is everywhere. It's like the athlete's foot of the forest. It's not, but if a plant is susceptible and gets stressed, it's going to get um, 
of the disease will flourish it, instead of just lying latent. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So drainage, yes, will definitely help, but it is also possible that those maples would have not done so well anyhow, just because sometimes they just don't. Oh, okay. um, it's, it's not your fault. Uh, but yeah, French drain is always a good idea, especially um, if you have that heavy, heavy soil, because that really takes a lot of healing, hard pan. And on the island here, we have these layers, these strata of soil, and you'll have a clay layer and then some sand, and then you'll have hard pan under that. And the water sheets along the top of the hard pan and on top of the clay layers and seeps out in different places. Um, and that makes it really hard to control how, you know, that's a so big piece. What's the definition of French drain? French drain is basically a trench with a crushed gravel in it. Crushed gravel because it doesn't uh, lock together and it will keep um, pulling water away. And French drains are often put around houses that are on a slope on the upside so that water doesn't run into the basement or you would put it around a, um, a you know, bed like, like, like what Laura's talking about to pull off some of the water. Um, here in my neighborhood, there's quite a lot of slope difference between myself and the neighbor. So I put in a little French drain all along the north side of my property, just a small one, but big enough to pull the water that's coming off her property to back to the street instead of having it into, under my house. Because, no. I have two more questions about the French drain. Okay. One is, how deep should I trench the French drain, should I go all the way down to hard pan or can I just go down like 12 inches? Or? Yeah, 12 inches is great. I mean, eight to 12 is fine. And you know, honestly, I would cause it to be done by others, which is the first principle of sustainable gardening, that when it's really hard, heavy work, you know, you can wreck your shoulder, as I know from experience. Yeah. Um, so don't harm yourself, you know, pay, get Bainbridge Youth Services in there or get a good garden crew to come in and do it. They know exactly how to do that and they'll do oh, it well. Okay. And then where should I place it? Should I place it where the water is pooling or should I try and catch it before it comes in or both? Well, if you said you have a slope and then it flattened area below that, yeah. I put it at the base of the slope. Okay. And then draw it away. And one of the things you can do if you have enough property is where you draw it away, you can make a rain garden, essentially. And you can put things like a dog, twiggy dogwoods or a corkscrew willow, somebody that loves a lot of excess moisture. You can even plant blueberries along the upslope side of that because they really like wet feet too. Um, oh, okay. So take advantage of, you know, you're creating a new moisture situation and you can take advantage of that by putting it kind of in places where things will want to be. Okay, cool. Thank you. Sure. I see Reed actually put some stuff in the chat. Um, he says, it sounds like I should be thinking more about what vegetables can live next to each other when I sow my seeds. Y yeah, I don't, I don't do a lot of direct sowing into the garden. I do some. I throw calendula seeds around and I often throw sunflower seeds around. But for the most part, I'll sow into small, like two inch pots and do it that way. Because what that will do is I know they have an intact root system. I can wait until they're big enough. I have a little teeny sun porch, which I grow my stuff in until it's big enough to put out. Um, and your spacing, your ultimate spacing is gonna be easier if you can move a little plant rather than throw a handful of seed. The obvious uh, things that you do wanna direct sow are gonna be tap-rooted plants like carrots and beets because they do not take well to, to root disturbance. <laughs> Obviously, if a root is disturbed, it, it won't form properly, and then you get really funky carrots and beets, which sometimes you do anyway just because of the stones and things in the soil. Um, but that's just something to think about. Like if you want to scatter lettuce, I'd rather sow just two seeds in each of the little pots, and your seed goes a lot further, and you can sow it every three weeks and keep replacing the plants you use and keep it coming steadily and get nice little plants and not feed the slugs, the babies. Mm. His other question was, what's a good way to convert my lawn areas into a more sustainable grasses, clovers, and so forth? Can I do that in stages? That is a great question. Um, in a lot of cases, you'll find that it's nature is doing that already. If you have an area that's got a lot of clover, that's usually a low nitrogen area. Clover's quintessential nitrogen fixer, and that is helping you immediately. Um, there's some great grass mixtures that you can get at most of the nurseries that are Pacific Northwest mixtures that are specific to this region. And there's like a shady lawn mix, there's a playground mix, there's um, 
low bro or low mo um, mixtures that were actually specifically bred to not get very high so they don't get 12 inches or 18 inches and have to get machine macheted or weed whacked uh, so there's a lot of different kinds and there's floral lawns or fleur de lawn it's called um, that have a lot of different herbs and things mixed in those are great except if you've got kids running around barefoot not so good because it tends to attract a lot of pollinators and running on stepping on bees is never a good experience um, but yeah and if you have a place that you just really want to put a bed and get rid of the lawn literally you can actually just you know, if you can get at it with a truck, you can back a truck up, dump it, and rake it out and have it be 12 to 18 inches deep with sloped sides, put herbs around the sides like I talked about before, or creeping ground covers if it's an ornamental bed, and plant right into it. And it will, especially, and then put compost mulch over the whole thing. Um, and you could put humic acid on the bottom before you have the soil dumped. And what you'll find is that as, the, as it will, as the plants grow and you keep tending that mound bed, mounded bed and watering and adding more humus, um, the soil underneath will open and the worms will do the digging for you and you don't have to kill yourself. Yay, worms. Yeah, worms are awesome. <laughs> hey, yeah, we're trying to get rid of our grass. I don't oh. want to have to mow for as much. And it's so ridiculous that we humans are doing that anyway. So um, we love trees, we love evergreens. Um, we've got a bunch of holly that we're gonna cut down. They're trees, they're huge and they're really invasive. Um, but it, are there any plants that you would recommend for you know, kind of uh, filling in the grassy areas and making the plants happy? Well, okay, a couple things here. So when you cut a holly down, you actually have to take the roots out because it will sucker and continue to grow. And holly roots are not small. I mean, we have had the best luck by chaining them up and putting them on the back of a truck oh. and pulling them out. But, you know, a young crew of strapping gardeners can probably do it with a sawzall and picks and things, but it's a huge undertaking and you have to get those roots out or you will not be able to have something else there. Okay, um, so it won't be us, it'll be the gardeners. I would cause it to be done by others, definitely. Um, the other thing to think about is that if you have big grassy areas and you'd like to convert them, think about an arboretum, think about spacing again, how, and read up carefully on how big plants are gonna be. One of the things to remember is that in nursery business, the ultimate size of that it says on the label of a lot of plants, woody things like shrubs and trees, the ultimate size is often the size it will be at 10 years. Because literally, the, the, this is what you get taught in things when you go to like uh, educational programs for nursery people. In 10 years, it will either have died, the people will have moved away, or they would have killed it. Carol Grant's book, The Tr Shrubs and Trees of the Pacific Northwest, the library has it. And it's a classic great reference because they actually measured stuff in the Northwest from Corvallis up to Canada um, and said, okay, on the East side, it's gonna get this big. And on the West side, it's gonna get that big in 20, 30, 40 years. There's What's also the a, good, a good website called the um, Great Plant Picks website for, uh, and it's the Northwest area. And it's kind of, it's, um, always updated and changed, but it's sort of run by a bunch of excellent plants people. And that will say um, height in 10 years and then ultimate height or width. And those things are different. But if you're gonna convert a big area like that, you wanna think about what how big the trees will be at maturity and not put uh, them too close together. Like if you're gonna have a chestnut tree, that tree is gonna be 40, 50, maybe 60 feet high and wide, which means most of you can only have one. <laughs> but if you're putting in smaller trees, um, things that are going to mature to be 20 feet, then you've got to figure, uh, you'd have to look whether the shape is wide or narrow, um, how big, how much space you have to allow for it. But you do have to allow for it. But what you can put in between is shrubs. And in the first years, I don't know if any of you went to Bloedel when they were just starting that shade garden down by the stream. Um, sort of near the slope by the house. When they first planted it, it was a sun garden. So they were planting for ultimate shade, 
So they were planting plants that were gonna grow up and make shade. And then the understory changed over about a six or seven year period from shrubs and, and perennials and things that liked sun to those that preferred shade as the shade developed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's a long-term project in other words, but how fun could that be, Megan? <laughs> Well, so we we're in the shade. We have about six, seven hours of full sun, um, and and so if we're planting new new plants in effort to not have to mow the grass, just to have a regular natural flora and fauna, um, and there's only about six, seven hours of daylight, would it be better to plant shrubs right now or trees? Oh, you can plant trees, but just space them, prop, you know, really space them very generously and then put shrubs in between them. Okay. And then as things change, because as stuff grows up, five, six, eight, ten years down the road, you'll see that you're, you have a very different environment and then you can put it. But if you, in an open area, if you stick plants that really need a lot of shade, they might not thrive now because even six or seven hours of daylight, of full sun is more than some of them would like. But things like hydrangeas would adapt. So you could have lots of hydrangeas and hardy fuchsias, and then down the road, they'd still be perfectly happy as it became more shady. I'm gonna take one quick bread break and I'll be right back. All right. So I'm gonna, my, my next question is gonna be about aphids. Does anybody here have uh, any solutions on how to deal with aphids? Well, we I, had aphids I, last uh, year in our nasturtiums uh -huh. and, and it was on a certain stock. So we promptly removed that. Okay. Uh, the right. whole infested part right. seemed to work. Yeah. La ladybugs. La I know. Where do we get ladybugs? At, uh, hey, hey. At, uh, either there or over at the garden. Over at, um, at the garden. Cambridge Gardens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then you just keep them in your refrigerator and, and they, they stay dormant. And then you take them out a little bit at a time and put them on your plants. And it, it worked. I couldn't believe it. It worked just beautifully. Okay. But it's here's what you need to think about if you're going to do that. And right. it, that is that when you release ladybugs, and especially now, because, you know, as it's warmer, um, the first thing they want to do is have a drink. So okay. before you release them, you want to spray, hose everything down so that it's really wet. The second thing they want to do is have sex, and you can't help with that. But <laughs> Then they start laying eggs. And so when you see the little eggs, don't like look them up online and check and say, is it a ladybug egg or something else? Oh, okay. The other thing is that the ladybug uh, youngsters look like little black crocodiles, kind of. Oh. And so you might not recognize that as a larval stage of a ladybug and people gush them and squish them and then say, I don't know what happened. They all went away. It's like, well, you have to know your territory. Yeah. <laughs> Through yeah. the stages, right? The ages and the stages. And, and so, um, yeah, it works really well to release them. It does. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes if they're in the refrigerator for a really long time and you're still releasing a little few of them in a August or something, they can get a little tired. It's kind of hard on them to be in dormancy that long because that's not really very natural. But for a lot of, uh, I mean, and Sheila's got a little teeny tiny garden, so it's different. But if you have a big enough garden, you can release them in several places and you'll get different population zones growing. And then you will should have them um, pretty regularly. I actually brought some in accidentally on some plants and so they've been in my greenhouse and they're still in there. Oh wonderful. It's not a greenhouse, it's my teeny sun porch, but I call it my greenhouse. Yeah. yeah. It's so probably ladybugs eat awesome. aphids. They do. They and white fly. Okay. The other thing of course is the first line of attack with aphids or almost any kind of pest, spit bugs and all that kind of stuff, your first line of attack is the hose. Because okay. if you squirt them hard, they should they come off and they fall to the ground. And that's like a lifetime journey for them to get back up there. And they're, mm. they don't know where they're going anyway. And yeah. half of them will drown. There's a great thing called, oh gosh, what is it? It's a, an attachment for your hose that puts a lot of pressure on it. And it's like a teeny tiny pressure washer for um, oh, okay. bugs. But it's not so high that it will like kill your plants. Right. But, um, but you can rinse off a lot of things like that and okay. without using chemicals or anything. Slugs are still with me. Slugs are still with you. It might be beer time. You remember that their preferred beer in the great wide test of St. Pauli Girl Dark, but pretty much any beer will do. Which one, Anne, is that? St. Pauli Girl Dark. 
St. Pauli a, Girls Dark. Yeah, St. Okay. Pauli Girls is really cheap beer. I don't know if they even sell it around here, but I think they do because I used to get it all the time. Um, the dark beer is what the slugs like the best. And so- do they, like, do they like stout then? Probably, but I wouldn't waste stout on a slug. No, I, I know, I know that, but- <laughs> You know, I was thinking when you, if I released the ladybugs, you said the first, you know, the first thing they want to do is drink, drink. I was thinking, oh my gosh, they'd be drinking the beer I have out for the slugs. <laughs> they'd be so okay I, with that probably. <laughs> right? yeah. They're not, in, they're not, they're not, are probably wine drinkers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you can also, sometimes you'll get a little infestation of ladybugs in the house, usually like in February or March, and they'll get all over the windows trying to get out. And those are ladybugs that were imported from Korea mm. quite a long time ago by the USDA as crop uh, tenders, I guess. Right. right. But <coughs> you can actually gently sweep them into a glass, uh, like I put them in a canning jar with a little bit of a moist paper towel mm -hmm. and um, just screw the lid on loose so that air yeah. can exchange and put that in the fridge um, and remind yourself, I put a piece of tape on it with the date when I put that in there. And then you can pull that out and put in, let them out in the garden and they'll do just fine too. Okay. Yeah. They're not naturally house dwelling, but they try to get into a dark place to hibernate and it can be in your walls of your house sometimes. Yeah. Our daughter, her apartment in Redwood City, she has a lot of ladybugs in her apartment. Yeah. 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 And it, interesting. I had no idea. That's the reason why. So thank you. Just, just looking for a home. Yep. Yep. So. They want to live in California. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> Maybe I could uh, uh, bring some up here. I can go to her apartment and bring there one. You know. Yeah. Well, most of the ladybugs that you buy were harvested in caves in Mexico, where billions of them overwinter, and they go dormant in the caves. And then people go in and dig them, literally shovel them up into bags and things, and take them and then sell them to you. Um, so <laughs> you know, you might as well harvest them closer to home, right? Sure. Get them from Aaron's apartment, right? Absolutely. Why not? <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> I, want, I want. I I wasn't here because I had to take that other phone call. But as far as my tomatoes go, I just want to, you know, the saga, the the drama of it all of, of Sheila's tomatoes. Um, I of a stew piece and um, that wasn't doing anything. And I was thinking about out loud that maybe I should maybe go over and get another new plant and, and plant the new plant and, and do, I had done all the closing it up around and making it warm at night, da, 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 da. all of the stuff that I was told to do, put the salt water in there, everything was done. Little Miller could go, go twice a month. Anyway, didn't do anything at all, but I was saying it out loud. About two or three days later, the damn thing started growing. Yeah. <laughs> and I, think, I think it got scared. <laughs> I think I scared it into it. And I have a four and a couple little ones that are about yay big around. I think I can show you. Um, yeah, that um, that were there to begin with. I mean, almost there to begin with. But I've got lots of blossoms and stuff. And today is, is miracle Grow day. So therefore, you know, whatever. <laughs> well, who you, gave them, you already gave them the sea, the sea water, right? Well, that's because it will make me it's sweeter. And it did. You were absolutely right. They were so much sweeter last year. They were ma magnificent last year. Yeah, it really boosts the flavor. If, if you didn't hear that one before, once a tomato plant starts getting, um, starting to set flowers and stuff, you can give each plant water at first so you don't hit the roots with uh, salt water. But And then you put a quart per plant of seawater uh, into the, each pot or around each plant in the ground. And what it will do is, it's not just the salt, but it's partly the salt and all the minerals that are in seawater um, that they really Im greatly improve the flavor of tomatoes, but also peppers and things like that too. Um, yeah. I only do, need to do it once for the- for Yeah, the just once, because you don't want to overdo it. Um, and that came out of research done by um, Cornell and Rutgers for, for uh, commercial tomato growers in New Jersey. Um, probably 10 years ago now, but I thought it was fascinating. And they were actually selling powdered seawater <laughs> for oh people who live in, you know, Iowa or something, right? You we know, this is when I wish my husband was still alive because he was the, uh, one of the uh, paramount element um, pe people in uh, the East, East, 
he was at Penn State and he studied tomatoes. Then mm -hmm. that was his thing. And he, um, he, he went all the way around all over the place. And this is why I do wish he was still alive because I, I, I don't know that he would know that, you know, because we're talking back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 60s, 70s maybe, um, when, when, he, when we were at Penn State. But um, amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty uh, interesting. There's a new breeding group in the Northwest or the whole West Coast, really. It's called West Coast Culinary uh, I, something rather. Anyway, it's a group of plant breeders and chefs, professional chefs, who have got together over the last 10 years or so and started collaborating because one of the things the chefs were saying is, you guys only do field tests on raw food out in the field we cook with it. We need to know what it's going to cook like. And some plants, like they wanted a, one of the first ones was this red pepper called stocky straight wall red, because there's no kitchen waste. Wow. Which I never even thought about that, right? But it's like they, you know, a lot of the ones that kind of go in at the top and then you've got your, your, this stem and they had to cut the whole top off and couldn't use it. And if they're too, blo if they're not blocky enough, the bottom isn't really usable very much for restaurant work. Um, which I thought was sort of fascinating. So that it's a delicious pepper, good raw, or but it cooks extremely well, and there's no kitchen waste. Ah, who thought? So there's a whole bunch of things like that that they're bringing out. So if you look at a plant and it has this sort of a oblong little label, cream-colored label that says um, culinary cul culinary collaboration, I think is what it says. Uh, you'll read a little something about that and know that it's a really flavorful, good choice. Ooh, kind of cool. That makes total sense. Oh Do we have any over at, the, over at the gardens? Yeah, there should be some. Um, I got a bunch, so I don't think they probably did too. And you know, one of the other tradition, one of the other things they were doing is a, a collection called suitcase seeds, which are uh, heirloom varieties that came over with people who emigrated to America and brought their family favorite seeds of different kinds of edibles right with them so there's what is it called seeds, again suitcase seeds and there are squash and beans and peppers and all kinds of things even greens and things um, another one they selected was a hungarian land race parsley so parsley of course you know it's commonly used all over the place but a land race is a specific Almost, not native, but it becomes almost like native if it's grown enough, long enough. And so it's hundreds of years. So the land race Hungarian parsley is quite different actually to the regular, uh, it's much more flavorful, stronger flavor, oh. and a little smaller in the leaf. Um, but that's kind of cool. So they're growing sort of those ancient plants and heritage plants. Some of the ancient grains are being brought back. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Hey, we're almost out of time, believe it or not. I can't believe how fast this goes. Does anybody have a, a, a really important question? I mean, that you're just dying before we have to go? Oh, I guess we covered. Anything else, Anne? Any words of wisdom before we let you go? I don't know about that. That's kind of asking a lot. Michiko, did you have a question earlier? I couldn't tell. Martha's got one. Martha. When should I plant zucchinis? Oh, honey. Um, Never? <laughs> no, no. You got, I mean, you might as well give it a shot. It usually, it's just some years, they just don't do very well because it's not hot enough. If you have enough sun, they should do pretty well. They like uh, a lot more compost more than fertilizer. If they start to get mildewy on the foliage, you can get, uh, you can buy some skim milk powder or skim milk, I guess, um, and dilute it so that it's a, like a 10% milk and 90% water and spray it on the foliage. And that will do two things. It blocks the opportunities for the mildew and it gives the leaves and the plants more calcium. It's great for pumpkins and stuff like that too. Oh wow! Uh, because our soils are a little, they're pretty nutritious, but they're <laughs> kind of low in calcium. One mm. of the things the, the um, pioneers used to do that I thought was hilarious was uh, when they're growing big pumpkins, they wanted extra thick shells because they needed them to last a long time. So they would make a tiny slit in the stem going to each pumpkin and then pin that stem down into a dish of milk. And the plant will take the milk up. It will literally drink oh. milk and wow. make the shells harder. That's but it's easier to not, you know, just spray it with 
and I say skim milk because it doesn't need the fat, you know. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> Michiko, did you have a question? I saw you uh, unmuted yourself. Michiko. No, I I got um, sea waters. Yes. I'm going to go to the beach today. And yeah. And yeah, I take an empty milk jug and then just give each plant about a quart. Uh -huh. And yeah. it's really good for tomatoes and peppers. Okay. Um, in my greenhouse, all the tomato and uh, pepper is doing well, but oh. that's really good. Yeah, it really that's helps. It boosts the, the, the whole flavor spectrum, not just the sweetness, but okay. the savoriness as well. Okay, I thank you so much. Concur. I absolutely concur on that. It's just the most amazing thing. My, okay. my tomatoes were a thousand percent more tasty. And because what I did, what I ended up doing with the ones that I had left over were um, Ann Lovejoy's special baking thing of, at the end of the, uh, the growing season and baking them. And those things are mm -hmm. like candy when mm -hmm. I take them out. I, have them, I put yeah. them in the freezer, okay? And yeah. I take them out and Talk they're about like candy. They're so sweet. Yeah, you roast them. I cut them in half and put them, I put them cut side up. Some people put them cut side down. I rub them just, rub the whole pan with a little, um, I use avocado oil because it, it doesn't have its very strong flavor, but it, um, I don't know, it just. And a little salt. A little bit of sea salt, but then I roast them at 225 until they come, they sort of turn into like fruit leather, essentially, right? Oh. Or you can just, can them, put them in the freezer, pack them up and put them in the freezer and add them to stews and soups and things like that. Salads. They work on fast I mean, yeah. oh, mm, thank you, Anne. <laughs> the other thing that's really nice to do, and I know we're just got one a minute, is if you have a lot of basil and it's starting to bloom already, pinch all those blossoms off along with some leaves and grind them up with some sea salt. And you bake that at 225 for about 15 or 20 minutes until it crusts over. You put it back in your Cuisinart or whatever and grind it up again and that stabilizes it and it has the most incredible flavor mm. and scent and it's shelf stable for about a year and a half. Yeah. Whoa. This is yeah. what did you, the tomato mm. flowers or what? The basil. Oh, the basil. basil flowers. And there's basil. new kinds coming out called Everleaf that are bred to from the same culinary institute or uh, co collaboration. They're bred to bloom eight to ten weeks later than the usual kinds because once you know once they start to bloom you have to be picking out for them all the time because they just don't want they just want to bloom it's their cultural imperative but um that makes it harder to track you know to keep it the way you want and so these other ones the everleaf forms there's thai a genovese type and uh, another one i can't remember but they're sort of tall and columnar um they look amazing actually and they're really flavorful but because they don't bloom for a long time you can pick them and harvest them over and over and over without having to you can also let them go till you're ready for them and you don't have to which is kind of nice well oh, sounds wonderful i'm gonna go check those out so. yeah so that's the story about that thanks yeah. everybody well thank you all for coming and uh you know we'll, i hope to see you again next month ann you know, we'll we're we're gonna have more questions in July. So anytime, right? Alrighty. <laughs>